Hey, it's 11.30 and I think we can get started. Uh, so I'm Dr. Walter Korseth, the director, and I uh, want to welcome everyone to the second day of the Nonprofit Forum. I think we had really uh, a great day yesterday and uh, the uh, session today I think will be uh, equally um, uh, valuable to all of us. So we're going to be focusing on uh, how do we uh, increase the value of our research uh, and its results with uh, a, a greater emphasis on patient engagement, um, what tools and resources are available to nonprofit groups to help them achieve their goals, and also success stories, uh, particularly uh, targeting the importance of early diagnosis, um, which uh, we you know, certainly, Susan Schneider-Williams brought up yesterday, the issues of what happens when there is not an early diagnosis and the troubles that, that, that then ensue. Um, before going there, I just wanted to say that uh, meet, uh, the nonprofit forum has garnered a lot of attention. We have over 325 folks uh, joining us uh, remotely. Um, and, and so the silver lining to COVID is that it has allowed us to outreach uh, to more people than we did uh, when everything was in person. Um, and then I did want to mention that um, uh, we owe our debt of gratitude to Margot Warren. Um, uh, who is uh, retiring um, shortly. Uh, Margot uh, has been instrumental in putting together the nonprofit forum from its very beginning days. And uh, so we're indebted to Margot for that, but she's also been in NIH communication positions for 33 years. Um, and uh, she's spent uh, much of her time over 25 years on public education messaging on stroke research and treatment. Uh, she and I worked together uh, when I was working for the Academy of Neurology on stroke education and um, way before I came to NIH uh, when uh, TPA was first approved. Um, the, new, the most recent of our achievements is the Minor Risk Campaign, which I mentioned earlier and would encourage people to, um, to take a look at on the website. Um, and uh, so the nonprofit forum yeah, began in 2005 under the leadership of Story Landis and Margo. Um, and she's been a member of the executive committee ever since. Um, so uh, can't say how much we will miss Margo, uh, but wish her well in her retirement. Uh, so thanks for all those efforts. They really paid off Margo. And- Thank you, everybody. I've really enjoyed working with you. Um, I think we've worked together, some of the executive committee members for well, more than a decade, and um, this meeting is really um, admired by other institutes. I think we're the only institute that really has this format, and thank you all. The best patient groups are involved, of course, for making it so successful. It's really been one of the highlights of my career, so thank you. Thank you, Margo, and be careful in retirement. Very dangerous career change. <laughs> um, all right, so we're going to let's go into our first session, um, which is uh, focusing on patient engagement. And our co moderators are Dr. Nina Shore, the deputy director for NINDS, and uh, Richard Benson, who's the head of our Office of Health Equity Research. Uh, so hats off and microphone over to Nina and Richard. Welcome to the patient engagement co-producing clinical success session of the Nonprofit Forum. I'm Nina Shore, and I'm the Deputy Director of the NINDS. Uh, by way of background, uh, I am a child neurologist clinically and a pharmacologist uh, from a research standpoint. My role at NINDS is really to uh, oversee uh, such things as strategic planning, and career development programs for the individuals both within and outside of NINDS. Um, today, we are gonna talk uh, in many, many different aspects about patient engagement and what it means for research. Um, what excites me about this and what makes me feel so good about having an open discussion about this with all of you uh, is the fact that without patient engagement, not just by that I mean participation 
in the studies, but patient engagement in designing studies, in choosing what to study, uh, in deciding what outcome measures mean something, uh, it really allows us to make research address the problems that directly affect patients and families and populations. Uh, the science is wonderful and the science has to underpin everything that we do, but if it doesn't make a difference for the well being of the patient population, then it isn't in the mission of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, so uh, now I'm going to turn the podium over to my colleague, Dr. Richard Benson. Thank you, Nina. My name is Dr. Richard Benson, and I'm the director of the Office of Global Health and Health Disparities in the Division of Clinical Research at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. I am a vascular neurologist and have been an investigator on many clinical trials, as well as several large epidemiologic studies. My passion is engaging diverse communities in the clinical research enterprise, public health education and health promotion. I am excited by all the great work that your nonprofit organizations are doing to enhance clinical research by bridging the gap between patients with specific neurological diseases and researchers. Your intermediary position is paramount for building trust with the community and accurately reporting complex medical results in lay language. I applaud you for all of the great work that you do. So today, we hope to outline strategies that nonprofit groups can readily implement to foster engagement and to build trust between patient communities and researchers. Uh, during this discussion, we hope to emphasize both community and relationship building within the wider research landscape. Um, for this session, we put together a group of panelists with an array of experiences and from across job sectors, from the federal government at the NIH and the FDA, to private consulting, to nonprofit groups. And we hope that together they will offer both unique perspectives and a holistic view of how to foster better engagement between patients and researchers. So I will introduce the first two of our panelists. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Baker will speak first. Uh, Dr. Baker is the director of the Helping to End Addiction Long-Term Initiative or the HEAL Initiative in the office of the director at NIH. She is no stranger to patient and community engagement, having worked previously in the NIH Office of Science Outreach and policy. And then we'll hear from Captain Robin Bent. Captain Bent, who is an officer in the US Public Health Service, is a director of patient-focused drug development at the Food and Drug Administration. She worked for 20 years as a pediatric nurse, and currently her department at the FDA facilitates patient-focused drug development meetings to advance patient engagement. Richard? Thank you, Nina. Our next speaker will be uh, Roger Lamoureux. Uh, Roger uh, has spent over 10 years um, with the Adelphi Values um, Company. Um, he has, has had many roles, including uh, conducting one-on-one -on -one interviews with clinicians and patients in his current role, uh, Roger oversees activities for multiple projects in various therapeutic areas. He coordinates the work of research teams, provides um, the first review of qualitative analysis and reports, and tracks projects, timelines, and budgets. And our last speaker uh, will be Mary Ann Meskis. Mary Ann was a founding member of the Dravet Syndrome Foundation, uh, stepping off the board to take the position of executive director in 2012. Um, thank you. And now I'm going to hand it over uh, to Dr. Rebecca Baker. Thank you, Dr. Benson. And thank you um, to everyone for inviting me to speak to this terrific group. 
Thank you again for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about how patient um, engagement and partnership is so important to the NIH HEAL or Helping to End Addiction Long-Term Initiative. I'll start with a reminder of um, what we're up against. Uh, this is the national crisis of opioid use, misuse, addiction, and overdose. Nearly 90,000 Americans died from a drug overdose in the 12 months ending in October of 2020, the most uh, recent time for which we have good data. The majority of those overdose deaths were associated with opioids. And um, this is the culmination of many years of increases in drug overdose and overdose death. And these are people who are dear to us and way too many lives that are being lost um, on account of this crisis. So we at NIH and in the HEAL initiative are really working to develop scientific solutions that can be helpful to the family members, caregivers, providers, and community members um, that are facing this crisis. And then um, recognizing as well that it's not just opioid misuse and addiction, but well, in order to provide lasting and durable solutions, we also need to address the crisis of untreated or unmanaged pain that can put people at risk for um, opioids. And so these numbers are really astounding. 50 million American adults are affected by chronic pain about half of them experience severe pain on a daily basis, and about 20 million have such high impact pain that it keeps them from doing things that are important in their lives. So that could be family, work, um, other caregiving responsibilities, and um, is really just a significant source of pain and disability in our country. And so what are um, research initiative has sought to do is to join the power of science with the strength of communities to combat these two crises. We've done this by supporting over $1.5 billion in research um, to over 500 different projects um, across the country and really working in partnership. We know that solutions to these terrible crises are not going to be meaningful if they don't serve the populations that we're seeking to help. People who experience pain, people who experience opioid misuse and addiction, and those who love them. And so we are working in partnership with a, a broad array of stakeholders, and that includes scientists across different disciplines, but it also involves folks in communities care settings, justice settings, and other places where people come seeking help for pain or addiction. And so I'm just very pleased to be able to meet with you all today. Um, I'll just give you a brief overview of the types of um, people involved in our research. We have research focused on enhancing pain management and really not all pain, pain conditions are the same. So that means really working with people who experience different types of pain, acute pain, um, different chronic pain conditions like um, pain following surgery, pain associated with sickle cell disease, pain um, of musculoskeletal types like chronic low back pain or arthritis associated pain, and then some specific neurologic and other pain conditions that can um, really affect people's lives. Then, so we're seeking to develop both new medications to treat those pain conditions and also um, test what works best in managing pain at an individual level, taking into account the many different um, pharmacological and also non-pharmacological strategies for managing pain. Then in the area of improving treatments for opioid misuse and addiction, we're working to develop novel medications. There are um, life-saving medications for the treatment of opioid use disorder, but they don't work for everyone and not everyone stays on them for long enough to achieve long-term recovery. So providing people and patients with additional options for treating opioid use disorder. 
understanding how opioid exposure can affect newborns um, if a mother has used pregnant has used opioids during pregnancy. Um, new prevention and treat, treatment strategies for opioid misuse and addiction that take into consideration sleep and mental health and other aspects of person's um, full life and what might put them at risk for addiction. And then lastly, translating research into practice, taking the evidence-based interventions that we have for opioid use disorder prevention and treatment and bringing them to places where um, where they can be most valuable. So that could include primary care settings or um, specialty healthcare settings, but it can also include the criminal justice system, schools, um, faith-based partnerships, et cetera. So um, as you all know, research has been really affected and our whole country has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and what we've seen is that our connection with patients and our connection with research participants has been challenged but also strengthened um, during this time. We found that um, certain strategies for social connection, and I'll just give you the example of virtual cooking sessions, have allowed us to stay in communication with members of our broader research and patient collaborative. and. Um, Many of our programs have focused on people kind of at um, dangerous or vulnerable moments in their lives. So for instance, a person might go into an emergency department following um, an opioid overdose, be detoxified and be released, and we want to initiate them on treatment for um, opioid use disorder to prevent future overdoses. Well, that's pretty tricky in the COVID environment. But what we found is that by giving patients choices um, for how they'd like to be communicated with, such as phone, video chat, WhatsApp, et cetera, we could um, sustain that research and sustain those connections with the individuals we serve. So I'll tell you just very briefly about this um, group that we've set up, the HEAL Community Partner Committee. This is a collection of individuals with lived experience. Um, to provide us in government and our researchers at large perspectives um, on issues that affect people with pain and addiction and also help strengthen our research by um, identifying outcomes that matter to, to people with pain and addiction, um, helping to design studies in ways that are going to deliver knowledge that's most valuable to them, and then also thinking about what we're gonna do with the information that comes out of those studies, how we will share it with the participants and people in their communities, um, how we will disseminate it and um, make sure that it's put into practice in ways that advance the goals of our community um, best hand in hand with um, patients, caregivers, providers, and, and others. So that's the end of my um, talk for today. I'm, I'll look forward to discussing and answering any questions you may have, but I'll now introduce Captain Robin Bent, uh, the next speaker in today's presentation. Thank you, Dr. Baker. So as, as Dr. Baker just mentioned, my name is Robin Bent. I'm the Director of Patient-Focused Drug Development in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the US FDA. And I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about FDA's thoughts on the importance of patient-focused drug development. Um, so patient-focused drug development, or PFDD, is defined as a systematic approach to help ensure that patients' experiences, perspectives, needs, and priorities are captured and meaningfully incorporated into drug, drug development and evaluation. And I don't think that we can overstate the importance of including patients in the drug development process. And the purpose of this slide is to really provide a visualization of some key time points where patient input can be valuable. But I want to emphasize that these are just examples and not a comprehensive list. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the next slide, but you can see that the, um, the entire drug development process really can benefit from patient involvement. 
And so here I want to take a moment and talk a little bit about the different types of patient experience data that, that's out there. Um, because we use the single term patient experience data, I think it can cause some, some confusion. So I'm going to briefly walk through some types of data and some examples of how they can be used. And of course, I'm speaking from the FDA, and so I'm thinking about this from a regulatory perspective, but I think you're going to hear later on today um, from some of my colleagues about the importance of patient experience data in the clinical and perhaps even the payer arenas as well. And so let me start by talking about um, patient registries or really natural history study data, particularly in areas of rare disease or other areas where we're still learning about the, um, the natural course of a disease. Information gained from um, natural history studies can enhance the understanding of the course of a disease over time. It can help to, they can help to identify biomarkers and clinical outcome measures to assess how well a patient responds to a treatment in a clinical trial. They can inform clinical trial design, support clinical trial recruitment. And as you'll hear in the next session, when Jeff Barrett talks about the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator data analytics platform, this patient level data can be shared with data repositories to optimize and improve the drug development process. Now, one point that I would um, very much like to stress before we move away from natural history studies is um, that if a natural history study is expected to be used to inform drug development in any way, even if it's a far off possibility, please come talk to FDA to make sure that we're on the same page as far as um, the data that's being collected, particularly um, the data points. Um, we also have guidance on rare disease natural history studies. And I, if this is some, a project that you're, you're planning to undertake, I would highly um, recommend or encourage you to review those guidance documents. They're actually very informative. Um, another type of study, study data are study reports or survey data, and these can help provide therapeutic context, um, such as the severity of a condition or perhaps some unmet medical needs. And this is really important information. One example of these study reports are the reports from patient-focused drug development meetings. These re reports provide FDA and um, medical product developers with information heard directly from patients about the impacts of their condition, the burdens or challenges of existing treatments, and what patients are looking for in a potential treatment. All of this forms the therapeutic context that we use as part of our benefit risk assessment when reviewing a marketing application. These meetings and the subsequent reports can also help um, drug developers identify potential new, par new targets for treatments and help us to understand if the endpoints being measured in clinical trials are really endpoints that matter to patients. Third type of data is clinical trial experience data, and it's another important type of patient experience data. Including patients in the design of clinical trials can enhance recruitment and retention for clinical trials, inform development of informed consent documents, provide insight into clinical trial participant burden, including frequency and conduct of trial visits and assessments. And um, this is information that may not be seen by FDA, but is very important. And while I personally think that patients should be included throughout the process just because it's the right thing to do. There is um, a good amount of evidence in the literature that involving patients in this portion of drug development can lead to faster recruitment, better retention, and fewer protocol amendments, all of which can um, decrease the costs of clinical trials and allow for faster answers to the research question. As I mentioned above, patients also provide input on um, the benefits and risks. And this could include information from patient preference studies and can help to inform future research, identify unmet medical needs that warrant further scientific discussion, inform FDA's benefit risk assessment, which is the framework used by the Center for Drugs to make marketing application or marketing decisions. Um, Another type of data, patients can help um, the medical community best understand ways to communicate information to patients and prescribers, which can then help FDA convey this key information to um, facilitate patients' informed decision-making. And this, this information can also inform communication and education for the patient community to enhance um, shared decision-making between patients and prescribers. So it takes it a little bit outside of just the regulatory context, but does move it kind of into the clinical context as well. 
And the final type of patient experience data that I'm going to mention um, today are clinical outcome assessments, or COAs. And these include measures such as patient reported outcomes, clinician reported outcomes, or observer or caregiver reported outcomes, and performance outcomes. And these can serve as clinical trial endpoints. And because they when they serve as clinical trial endpoints, it's so important to make sure that we're getting it right. They really should be developed with input from patients and can be used in many conditions to help ensure that what matters to patients is what's being assessed in the clinical trial. But um, these outcome measures are not easy to develop, um, and it's important that they are developed in a manner that is methodologically sound so that the measures developed are fit for purpose. And so if you're planning on developing these measures, I just wanted to bring some um, current and upcoming FDA guidance to your attention. FDA has been working on a series of methodologic guidance documents to enable stakeholders to go beyond um, the powerful narrative we hear in meetings and collect data that can serve as study endpoints and be used as a basis for marketing decisions. And so on this slide, you can see the four guidances that we are currently working on. The first guidance, Collecting Comprehensive and Representative Input, discusses sampling methods that could be used when planning a study to collect patient input. And we finalized this guidance document. Guidance two, the second guidance, will discuss methods for eliciting information from individuals identified in guidance one and present a range of methods and established best practices um, to identify what's important to patients with respect to burden of disease, burden of treatment, and benefits and risks in the management of a patient's disease. Guidance three will address refining the list of concepts of interest important to patients for measurement. And given that not everything identified as important by patients can be um, included in clinical trials um, or be measured, this guidance will address issues related to selecting what to measure for the medical purpose for medical product development program and identification or development of the fit for purpose clinical outcome assessments to assess outcomes of importance. And we're working on drafting this guidance. And the fourth guidance will address a series of topics, including clinical outcome assessment related endpoint development, defining meaningful within patient core change, and collection, analysis, interpretation, and submission of data. And all of these guidance guidance documents are written or will be written to really inform a range of audiences um, from the subject matter experts who are doing the actual developmental work to those who are thinking about embarking on a path to fund the development of these in instruments. And so if this is a path you're, you're planning to take, I would encourage you to check out those guidance documents. And so now I'm out of time, but if you have any questions, I hope you will submit them. I look forward to answering them. And I'd now like to turn the microphone over to Roger Lamoureux, who will talk about the value of patient-centered outcomes. Roger. So, hi, my name is Roger Lamoureux, and as Dr. Benson mentioned, I'm a research manager in the patient-centered outcomes uh, group at Adelphi Values. We're a pharmaceutical consulting company headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm really happy to be here with you today to tell you a little bit about what we do, why we do it, and why it matters. Um, when we want to know whether a medicine works in treating a certain condition, there are a couple of ways that we can go about it. So for instance, one way is to look at how the medicine affects people's clinical or laboratory results. Um, does it lower their blood pressure? Does it shrink a tumor? Does it make their heartbeat more regular? All of these things are important to measure, and they're often the primary way that we tell whether a medicine is effective or not. But another way to tell whether a medicine works and whether those clinical and laboratory results actually help people feel better is by asking the people who take it. For instance, does the medicine improve their symptoms? Do they have less pain? Can they think more clearly? Do their muscles feel less stiff? Or we can ask whether taking the medicine has made a difference in the way that their condition affects their lives. Can they do better at taking care of themselves? Uh, can they get around better? Uh, can, they get, can they socialize more with their friends? The people who have a condition are the ones who are best able to talk about what it's like, 
how it affects them, and how their experience changes or doesn't change with treatment. Whether they're adults, adolescents, or children, they're the experts on what it's like to live with the condition. So when we talk directly to people with a medical condition to learn more about their experience, we call it patient-centered research. And that is the primary work that my company does. Most often, we have in-depth conversations, usually an hour or more, one-on-one -on -one with people who have a medical condition to ask them about their experience of it. What symptoms do they have? How important or bothersome are they? How do they affect a person's life? What would they most like to see change about their experience? And we don't go into these conversations with a pre-planned agenda. Our aim is to hear in the person's own words what their experience is like and to understand it as completely as we can. We then spend lots of time thinking about what they've told us to see if we can identify any common themes and what it might mean about what should be measured from the patient perspective in clinical trials to help understand and evaluate whether a treatment works. To make sure that the right questionnaires are being used in clinical trials, meaning are they relevant and understandable to the patients who will be in the trials, we'll sometimes speak with people who have a condition and ask them to review a questionnaire that's been developed or chosen by the researchers to measure their experience. Are the questions clear? Do people understand what it says? Do the response options make sense? And is the questionnaire asking about things that are relevant and important to them? Or is there anything that's important to them that the questionnaire isn't asking about? And finally, sometimes we'll speak to patients at the end of a clinical trial to understand how their experience of their condition has changed since they started taking the treatment and whether they think that change is meaningful or important to them. There are other forms of this research uh, can take like uh, focus groups or surveys, but these are the primary ones that my group is involved all of them together make up patient-centered research. And why do we do it? There can be different reasons for doing this patient-centered research, and they aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Most often, we do this work because a pharmaceutical company has asked us to help them understand more about how patients experience the condition so they can figure out what's important to measure in a clinical trial and how best to measure it. At other times, our work helps to broaden the knowledge base in the wider scientific community, particularly for conditions that are rare or little known in a way that moves from collecting anecdotes to a more scientifically rigorous and systematic presentation of evidence, or else, Sometimes it can help uh, provide evidence to a regulatory agency like the FDA that the patient voice has been adequately represented in measuring treatment effectiveness or explaining why a certain approach to measurement has been taken. So the company that I work for and others like us, we stand with one foot firmly in the patient experience, one foot in the pharmaceutical industry, and I guess a third foot in the regulatory environment. Uh, lots of feet, but only one goal, to do our level best to make sure that the patient voice is accurately represented and effectively understood by all that are involved. And why does that matter? Whenever a new medicine is introduced to treat a condition, a lot of different people have a stake in it. The pharmaceutical company has spent a lot of time and money developing it. The regulatory agency like the FDA wants to do its best to make sure that the medicine is safe and effective and that it does what the pharmaceutical company says it does. 
Then you have the doctors who will have to prescribe it, the insurance companies who will have to pay for it, and the advertisers who want to get you to ask your doctor about it. Some would argue, however, that nobody has more at stake in a new treatment than the people who live with the condition day after day, the people who will be taking the treatment day after day, and the people who will live day after day with the success or the failure of the treatment. These people speak with the voice of the patient, and that voice needs and deserves to be heard among all the other stakeholders. That is ultimately why we do what we do at Adelphi Values and why we believe that it matters. Thank you. And now I'm happy to turn this over to Mary Ann Meskis. Thank you for uh, inviting me to join today and share our organization's experience with patient engagement. I'm Mary Ann Meskis. I'm the executive director of the Gervais Syndrome Foundation. And when our organization was formed back in 2009, it really came about when a few parents got together who were frustrated that there was a lack of research happening in our rare disease state. As a result, we really wanted to focus on funding research and we were fortunate to be able to get that started and really make an impact. But then it became apparent that we also really needed to be focused on engaging and educating our patient community so that we could be clinical trial ready should that opportunity arrive. Um, shortly after we discussed and decided we should move forward with something along those lines. We were fortunate to receive some funding from the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute that really allowed us to build a stakeholder group and, and really solidify our engagement. And one of the deliverables from that project was putting together a booklet for organizations that were coming up behind us that kind of explained what our process had been. And one of the things we had identified were these six pillars of engagement that really seem to help us quickly engage and, and move our community forward. So the first one was really focusing on connecting and educating our patient community. So we really try with the first interaction we have with any patient to get them involved with our private parent support group. And this allows them that opportunity to feel that they're a part of a community. And one of the requirements for joining the support group is to uh, complete something that we call our DSF family network. And that really gives us the opportunity to identify our stakeholders as well as where they're located, which has proved beneficial when we did get to the point of clinical trials that we could let pharmaceutical companies know where we had pockets of patients or you know, give them an idea of how many patients we had identified. Another big part of that for us is making sure that we train and engage our stakeholders. So anytime we have any type of educational event, we try to make an effort to include one or more sessions that talks about what patient-centered research is, um, what the importance is of the patient voice, and how they can get involved. Overall, our community really has a significant caregiver burden. They are dealing with complex medical issues pretty much around the clock. So we always want to make sure that they're aware of what's out there, and then they can decide how they want to participate. And so that kind of leads into identifying and addressing any participation barriers. So we really try to meet our families in the middle, like what works for them. And so they have opportunities to participate in surveys or if they want, they can participate in patient advisory panels. Um, we also try to give them information in a variety of methods. So even if they just want to help raise awareness, there's plenty of tools and resources available for them to do that. And then something else that we've seen that's been very powerful is making sure we're always reporting back to our community and disseminating the information that we're getting. Um, and any opportunities as well, such as for clinical trials. So our research coordinator does a really nice job of keeping families up to date. She'll host Facebook Lives where she can answer questions. We have a page on our website that kind of talks about everything that's in clinical trial now, as well as things that are in the pipeline. And then she's always available to answer those questions. And that has been really a big source, I think, of our, our families feeling involved and educated. Because with a rare disease, frequently they know more than some of the, the medical professionals they might see. And so having those tools and that information when they're speaking to them um, really empowers them. And then finally, we feel like a result of all of these pillars is that it's really helped us to identify new treatments. And we've been very fortunate for a rare disease community that since 2018, we've had three new treatments receive FDA approval for, with an indication for Dravet syndrome. 
And so I think it's also been very motivational for our community to feel that they've been a part of that and have been able to help make that happen. And if you have any interest in seeing this booklet, I have the link at the bottom of the slide, but really one of our mottos throughout this process has been nothing for us without us. And we always try to let, uh, when we have new industry members approach us, we really try to let them know how we're able to help them and, and really benefit them. Because for us, the, the biggest thing that we wanna see is new options for our patient community. Unfortunately, most of our patients are on polytherapies, their seizures aren't well controlled and they have significant comorbidities as well. So the more treatments that we can see come to market, the better opportunity we'll help have for higher quality of life for all of our patients. So we always try to let our, our um, industry members know that we really do have an engaged and educated community and that they understand what the value of the patient voice is. And I think Dr. Bentz did such a beautiful job in elucidating how important that is and really how it can help industry move things forward faster. Um, the other thing we can certainly offer them is we have very clear understanding of our disease progression as well as the comorbidities. And we also know what our caregiver concerns are, what they have to deal with every day and how being able to address some of those can really um, be helpful. So we, we'd like to encourage them to think about those as meaningful study endpoints. And then we can also help them with recruiting patients who can give design and any study endpoint or input. And we really encourage them to try to do that early on so that the patient voice really is starting out almost day one when they're deciding on their clinical study design. We've also become a very trusted conduit, not only to the top specialists in the field, but also to our community. And you know, our community is, has a lot to deal with and they want to know that they have a reliable source of information to go to. So um, we've, we've really built up that trust, which can be important as well. And then finally, we really see this as a two-way street and we want our industry partners you know, to also be respectful of our wants and needs. So we really ask them always to have mutual respect for our patient community, to always have honesty and transparency, and to really focus on making all of their study designs patient-centered. That is the most important thing, especially with the limitations of so many of our families. We wanna make it as easy as possible for them to participate. We also really encourage regular communication. We have found personally within the organization that we get the most engagement when there is um, a constant feedback <clears throat> and progress updates on what is happening. And then we also tell them time and again to show up. Community engagement is so important for our community. They wanna be able to put a face with that, that industry partner and have that opportunity to ask questions or learn more. So we say show up, show up anywhere you can, whether it's an educational event or a fundraiser, um, it's really appreciated and goes a long way in our community. And then finally, we really want them to make the effort to understand the diagnostic and treatment journey and the significant caregiver burden that our families have. We don't expect them to understand it if they haven't walked in our shoes, but I think taking that time to listen to patients share their stories, helps them give, get a better feel of what they're fighting for on their end for our families. And we always really appreciate um, them taking that extra step to be involved in there. And so I look forward to any questions that anyone might have. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back to Nina and Richard. Well, welcome back, everybody, and thanks to all of our speakers. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful array of uh, vantage points, really, from which to look at patient-centered research. Um, we had a question in the chat um, about how some of the nonprofit agencies can themselves get involved in patient-centered research. Um, you know, we have always at our nonprofit forum, we have uh, agencies that are uh, at various stages in their development and at various stages in engagement, both of industry and of the patient populations. How does a, uh, a nonprofit get involved either in doing or in facilitating uh, the kind of research that engages patients the best. Uh, I would ask our panelists to, to help respond. Sure, Nina, hi, this is Roger. Um, uh, thanks very much for the question. And I'd be happy to, to share a perspective from our little corner of the world here. Um, typically, uh, what 
the way that we end up interacting with these nonprofit groups is when we are, we've been asked to conduct a, uh, a study uh, by a, a pharmaceutical company or by another sponsor. And we need to identify uh, patients and caregivers who can give us a firsthand perspective on the condition, what it's like to live with it, how it affects them, uh, and can provide that important input. And particularly for rare diseases, uh, for us, these nonprofit groups have been hugely helpful in um, connecting us with patients. Um, for myself personally, and I know many of the people I work with, we love working with these uh, nonprofit groups. Uh, uh, I, I think what Marianne said in her presentation was right on target. These folks are typically educated about their condition. They're aware of it. They can speak to it. Um, they're motivated. Uh, and there's a level of passion there that you find uh, that really uh, helps to make our work um, uh, more productive. Uh, and at the same time, we, uh, we really value being able to give patients this voice to allow their voice to be heard, to be a conduit for it to be heard beyond the group, and, uh, and also to help to uh, shine a light maybe uh, on uh, conditions that are little known or little understood. Uh, um, great answer, Roger. Um, we had a uh, question yesterday, and this has been a Great, I really enjoyed the presentations uh, today from everyone. Uh, yesterday, we had a question um, and I'd like to hear from uh, Mary Ann on this particular question uh, in terms of how do nonprofits that, um, that deal with very rare diseases get started um, when you have a disease that people don't know about or don't know the name of what it is? Um, how do you get started and how do you engage uh, communities? You know, in our experience, you know, what had happened was when you get this diagnosis, you really are feeling lost and you're looking for other families that can relate to your experience and perhaps share things that have worked or haven't worked along their path. And so I think one of the things that really helped move our organization forward and begin to get us connected was having this private parent support group. And our organization takes the privacy and the safety of that group very seriously. And as a result, our families have come to rely on us as kind of a, the, the top source of information on Dravet syndrome. So this has also helped us when we're looking um, to educate about patient engagement and share why the experience of the patient voice is so important. They're willing to listen and hear that message because they know and they trust us. And so we, we started small and kind of built from there, but we found that it was really important that we would be clinical trial ready. And so we've built programs along the way to help engage and educate our community. And we make sure to remind them regularly about the importance of the patient voice. You know, it's interesting to me that um, uh, there is a sizable segment of the scientific community. And I would imagine the nonprofit community sometimes feels the same way that worries a little bit about putting the burden of education and information and input into clinical study design and so forth on the very people whose lives are already so burdened by the disorder that they're dealing with either themselves or in their loved ones. And yet I'm getting a picture from what all of you are saying of groups by and large who are hungering almost to be asked to tell about their experiences. How do you juggle on the one hand, engaging patients and families, but on the other hand, not overburdening them with educating you or bringing your studies up to speed? I, I can tell you from our patient community, one of the things that we ask is when there's those opportunities to share the patient voice, if um, we can have very clear guidelines as what will be expected of those parents. You know, as, as you said, our parents are really desperate. We want new treatments. We want a better quality of life for our children. So we are more than willing to go above and beyond, but sometimes those daily care restrictions can impede that. 
So, you know, we, that's why we try to offer as many opportunities as possible for our patients. So we let them know this opportunity has arisen, this will take an hour of your time in a personal interview, for instance, or this survey will take 15 minutes. And we've really found that by laying that out for them, as well as letting them know that we'll report back on what the results of that was, um, is really motivational for our community. Rebecca, under, uh, I just, just in follow up briefly of that, I, I wonder if you hear things like that from the pain community. Are they anxious to tell their stories or are they by and large so overburdened with their disorder and so um, intent on solving their problems in the moment? that it's hard to participate in something longer term. I, I can imagine sort of both sides of that issue. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, um, well, first of all, there are so many people with pain and so many different types of pain that they experience and so, so many changes over the lifespan that, um, that we, I think we see both sides. Certainly we recognize that the individuals with lived experience have a lot going on in their lives and pain is not just, you know, comes on its own a lot of times as associated or co-occurring with other health conditions. So these are um, people with a lot going on, but then on the other hand, they are typically have a lot to say about what their experience has been in healthcare or when they've tried to seek treatment for um, specific, you know, moments when the pain was very severe and they needed, um, additional care, and then also about what um, what works and doesn't work for them. You know, some, some folks really want to be able to get in their car and go to work. And so that is going to be, or, or take care of a family member or take care of um, children. And that, that, and they're comfortable living with, you know, and they know that living with pain will be part of that. And so they're seeking support in, learning about strategies that will help them do that. And other people are in such severe pain that's debilitating pain that they have really strong feelings about the need for medications to help manage it. And, and so we hear, I think a lot of different, um, a lot of different individual voices and, and areas of contribution from, from our community. It's always good to hear more though. So <laughs> in hearing this discussion, you know, we do have various fora and ways that we try to solicit input from the patient community, but I but I um, but I heard my colleagues' comments and Marianne, especially that sometimes when you have a busy life, that translation process can be a bit of a challenge. And so I think we'll take that to heart. But you know, for those who are tuning in today and taking part in, in the nonprofit forum, I think. Um, knowing that we are kind of constantly putting out messages and asking for reactions and input, we do read those and we do um, and bring them back to our various governance committees and incorporate them into our science. So, so please keep responding. There's a great question in the chat that I think may be appropriate for uh, Robin uh, from Caitlin Esposito. Uh, how can we identify appropriate industry partners who are interested in producing drugs or medical devices? that would be beneficial for our individual patient groups. So I'm, I'm going to admit that because most of my most most of my talk kind of focuses more on drug development, that I may not be the the best the best resource to answer this this question. But um, I, I think if there are medical devices, the Center for uh, Medical Devices has a very active patient engagement group. So CDRH at the FDA has a very, very active patient engagement group and a lot of really good resources there. If um, if some of the, the treatments are involving medical devices, um, they might have some good resources for you, as well as if there are medical devices involved, reaching out to medical device developers to, to engage with them, whether that's holding a meeting, holding um, a meeting, maybe working with a, an association, a professional association where these surgeons will meet and maybe having information sessions during, during um, or uh, close to some of their meetings or things like that are all, all potentials for, um, for engagement. Well, Robin, the benefit of this forum is that we have such experience here on, on, the, uh, on this call. Is there anyone else who has um, 
has dealt with this before and has had to um, engage industry partners. Please unmute. Or raise your hand. So Hi. This, this is Ron Bartek. Um, we have a lot of experience in our patient group of uh, engaging in the industry partners. I would just um, say in response that all that you can do as a patient organization to um, develop the assets that industry partners need to succeed, to give them the best shot on goal in your disease group. In other words, uh, like presenters have already emphasized the importance of natural history data, the importance of patient registry um, a, for contact information for recruiting your patients, the importance of um, doing your surveys to maybe even scheduling a, an externally led patient focused drug development meeting to identify what's important to your patients. If you can, uh, and you start working with clinicians that are willing to perform the clinical research for the industry partners. If you can develop all the, or some of these assets, they will come. It's like build it and they will come in the field of dreams approach. Um, so that, that's the best way to attract these industry partners to want to work in your disease. This is Jackie French. I just wanted to say that in the epilepsy space, the Epilepsy Foundation runs a pipeline meeting every other year where we have all of the people that are interested in both drug and device development and epilepsy come to a single space. And we try to have as many people with epilepsy and caregivers as possible there as well, so that there can be some mingling, a little difficult in the last couple of years. Um, and uh, you know that is a really good place to learn about what those companies are involved with and whether they might be interested in, in your disease. And this is Christiana Evers from the Parkinson's Foundation. I added in the chat a link to an article we published in Health Expectations around uh, developing a framework for patient engagement and also including metrics. And we have found, um, we've about over 15 years of experience in the field of patient engagement. We have found that to be very helpful in terms of working with industry and also working with researchers. Um, the key, and I know some folks in the chat mentioned this as well, it is um, when you're working with industry, the type of collaboration, it has to be equal partners, right? And the piece about closing the loop and making sure that participants, anyone who participates in a project gets feedback on it. That's one of the key pieces and you would see outlined in, in our list of metrics. Thank you, uh, Christina, Jackie, and Ron. Those were uh, excellent uh, responses uh, to that question. Um, I see there's a, another comment in the chat as well in terms of uh, a question, is there an engagement list that nonprofits can get on? And so I think this is probably a great forum in terms of starting that. I don't know, uh, Marianne, Roger, are you familiar with that type of list? If not, this may be a great way to start it now just by communicating with each other. Any comments on that in terms of an engagement list? No. Uh Oh, go ahead, Mary. No, no, go ahead. I, I don't have a suggestion, Roger, so please. Yeah, well, I'm in the same boat as you. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any list uh, that's, that's out there that's been put together, um, but I think uh, that would be an amazing resource to have. And I would just add that while we don't have an engagement list, we have gotten a lot of support from some of the rare epilepsy consortiums that we're a part of. And so there's a lot of um, sharing by the leaders of other organizations that we found to be really beneficial. Well, thank you. I think we're getting near the end of this particular session. There was another question uh, from Robert Stone in terms of successful examples of companies presenting NDA with um, natural history data. Maybe this is a question that you can um, send directly to Robin, Robert, um, to get a response to that. Um, unless there's anything else burning, I'm going to turn it over to Nina to have the, the last uh, word um, for this session. Well, I just really want to thank our speakers again. Really wonderful uh, summaries of very complex areas. I mean, the interplay among 
uh, the nonprofits, the patients and families themselves, the scientists involved, the industries involved, um, really very, very complex uh, relationships that I think all four of you summarized beautifully for us. Um, many, many thanks to the audience for your, I mean, really once again, an incredibly engaging discussion. And I'd encourage everybody to read uh, the comments in the chat, really some very, uh, very astute observations and some questions that I think will generate a lot of uh, discussion offline. And thanks uh, also to my colleague, Richard Benson for uh, uh, co-hosting. Um, and now on with the rest of the nonprofit forum. Thank you so much, Nina. That was a fantastic and really informative session. Um, so I will take back over in my little MC role here briefly uh, to actually just announce that we are headed into about a now nine minute uh, break. So everyone, uh, speakers, uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for that fantastic discussion. Um, and everyone else, please take a moment uh, to water yourself, whatever you need to do. And we will be back at 1240. Uh, with our next session, which is on tools and resources of note for nonprofit organizations.